Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative webinar, Tackling Transna Transnational Robocall Scams, the Importance of Local, State, and Federal Partnerships. Now I'm going to turn this over to Shelley Jackson, consultant to the Elder with the Elder Justice Initiative, and our mission is to support and coordinate the department's elder justice activities. And we do that by promoting for older adults, helping older victims and their families, enhancing state and local efforts through training and resources, and supporting research to improve elder abuse policy and practice. We'd like to also invite you to visit the Elder Justice website at elderjustice.gov where you'll find resources and information for elder justice professionals. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Vonda Matthews, a policy analyst with the COPS office and co-sponsor of today's webinar. Thank you, Shelley, and thanks to the Elder Justice Initiative for allowing us to partner with you and share your multitude of resources that you have available for the field. Um, I'm, like Shelly mentioned, I'm with the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, or COPS Office. Um, I also want to give a quick thank you to Liz um, for facilitating and making this possible. And our speakers today, Assistant U.S. Attorney Jolie Porter, our Senior Special Agent John Heslop, and Detective Margaret Moore. Um, we appreciate you sharing your expertise and experience on how you make a difference on what sometimes can seem like an insurmountable problem plaguing our community. But as you will hear, their partnerships, the local, state, and federal levels really can make a difference. Um, let me tell you just a tiny bit about the COPS office, is that we are sharing some resources too. We do have um, our collaborative reform initiative for technical assistance, where we do intake requests. We tailor technical assistance and training resources for the field, um, including elder fraud and abuse. Um, we're looking for training from the field, for the field, funding by our office. So if you have interest or you visit the COPS website, um, which is cops.usdoj.gov, and that's under collaborative reform to see for intake. Or all the things on the COPS website I'd like to highlight is we have hundreds of publications, and many of them in print we can send to you. Um, again, this is the COPS website for that. There's also, we have a series of podcasts. Some of them are in collecting evidence for elder abuse cases, roles of law enforcement, financial exploitation and a few other things as well as our community policing dispatch. Again, these can all be found on the COPS training portal. And the last thing I'd like to highlight is that we're going to be rolling out some solicitations. We have about 12 of them. We're getting ready to roll out this spring. So in the next week, I would say visit our website. That includes microgrants for law enforcement, um, some hiring grants, and a variety of other ones. So again, please visit the COPS website, um, and you can Google it. And if not, if you're not already signed up, you can also receive information on the latest resources, whether it's publication, grants, or some of our collaborative reform things. Just scroll to the bottom of the first web page on um, COPS. Um, and then you'll hit subscribe at the very bottom. So again, we welcome you and thank you. And I think we're ready to do our first um, poll, I believe. Yeah, so um, we'd like to get a, a feel for who's on our um, webinars, and so if you could just let us know what your professional affiliation is. We typically get uh, APS, law enforcement, looks like victim services, civil legal, um, aging services, and long-term care investment. So that is uh, typically what we see. But thank you. That lets us know who is um, uh, joining our webinar. We have one more quick poll question. So we also want to know uh, your level of experience in working in the field of elder justice, again, so we can uh, make sure that our webinars are meeting your needs. So um, none to a little experience, somewhat experienced, or extremely experienced. Okay. Good. It looks like most of you over half are somewhat experienced, and then another good chunk are extremely experienced. So thank you for that. Okay. And now it's my honor to introduce our speakers today. Jolie Porter is an assistant U.S. attorney with the Northern District of Georgia, and she's currently on detail to the Transnational Elder Fraud Strike Force at the department's Consumer Protection Branch. 
Senior Special Agent John Heslop is with the Office of Inspector General at the Social Security Administration. And Detective Margaret Moore is with the Aiken Department of Public Safety in Aiken, South Carolina. So Jolie, I will let you take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that great introduction. If you all are joining us today for this presentation, I imagine you have probably encountered phone scams yourself. Either you've received some of those annoying robocalls or you know someone, such as a family member or a loved one or someone in your community who has. I know I've received them, and I don't know if I know anyone who has a phone who has not received them. And you may have even come across a victim like the one I'm about to tell you about. This woman was 70 years old, living in Illinois, and she received a voicemail on her phone telling her that her social security number had been compromised and it had her call back a number. When she called back, she was put in touch with individuals who impersonated federal agents. They told her her social security number was involved in crime and that she would be arrested if she didn't pay. They ended up calling her numerous times a day from September to November 2019, and she ended up mailing them approximately $286,000 to various locations including addresses in South Carolina, California, New Jersey, and Florida. Then in November, she realized she had been scammed and she reported it to law enforcement. She was actually hospitalized soon thereafter. And I point that out um, to highlight that while we know these cases take a serious economic toll, in fact, in 2020 alone, consumers re reported to the FTC approximately $500 million in losses to phone scams. That's just what was reported to the FTC, not to other um, sites such as FBI's IC3. So it's an, a lower amount than the actual. The actual losses are over $500 million. But beyond the economic toll these scams take, they also take a serious emotional toll on everyone who's victimized, but they can take an especially serious toll on our elder population who fall victim to the scams. And you might be wondering if I'm on um, the transnational elder fraud strike force and I'm speaking with you all today about elder justice issues, why am I talking about phone scams? Well because we all receive them. The scammers cast a wide net. The voicemails go to all phones. They're not just selecting people who are elderly. Well, that's because when older Americans fall victim to these scams, they lose more money. This you can see on your screen in FTC data point. Um, in 2020, the average loss for individuals 70 to 79 was $635. That was about double of the law average loss for individuals age 20 to 29. And when you get to individuals who are over 80, they're losing about double what the individuals between 70 and 79 lose. It goes up to $1,300 in the average loss amount. Scammers prey upon individuals who are isolated, who are lonely, who will listen to them and don't verify what they're hearing on the phone. They take advantage when individuals experience cognitive decline. And they take advantage when older individuals have retirement savings that they can use to send to the scammers. Because U.S. residents are losing so much money to these scams, and because older Americans are especially vulnerable to losing a lot to them, it's especially important for us to understand, one, what the scams are, and two, how to respond when we encounter someone who's been victimized by one of these scams. Here we have a list of just some of the scams that phone scammers use to 
steal money from unsuspecting consumers in the U.S. There are company imposter scams. These um, scams involve the individual on the phone pretending to be a well-known company. A current one, um, or a current couple of them, the Amazon imposter scam and the Apple imposter scam. Um, in one version, the scammers leave a recorded message saying they're Amazon. They say something's wrong with your account that there's been a suspicious purchase or a lost package or an order you can't fulfill. They then uh, convince the person to call back or press one, and once they get them on the line, they trick them and they exploit them into either sending money or gift cards or providing personal information. Now, there's a whole list of types of scams on here, but I wanna note they all use a similar methodology. In all of these imposter scams over the phone, the scammers pretend to be someone who is trusted, such as a law enforcement agent, a known company, a tech support, someone to help with something, um, um, and then they trick individuals into sending money. There are, not only are companies impersonated, but government entities are impersonated. Social Security Administration, IRS, U.S. Marshal Service, um, those are just a few law entities. Many other law enforcement entities are impersonated. And another example is where an individual might be in the United States um, from another country and they're going through immigration processes with the USCIS. Scammers will even pretend to be US immigration and get the unsuspecting victims to send money to deal with supposed immigration issues. The grant, payday loan, and lottery or sweepstakes scams are similar in that they promise something. They pretend that you've won something big. You're gonna win the lottery, you just have to pay these fees. You just have to send this money. Well, if you have to pay to get something, it's a scam. Then there's tech support. This is very prevalent amongst our seniors who are looking for assistance on their computers. We often see individuals going online thinking they're getting tech support. They call a phone number or they see a pop-up ad and get in touch with someone that they believe is gonna help them with their computer. But in actuality, they were connected with a scammer. And that scammer will get access to their computer and their bank account. In one very common version, the scammer gets access to their bank account and pretends or makes it appear as though they've, they've deposited money into their account. And then the caller freaks out. They say, I'm gonna lose my job. I accidentally deposited $10,000 into your account. Get it back to me right now. Send it to me by gift card. Send it to me by mail. Do it now. And so the person is under stress and they follow the instructions. These are just a few of the existing scams. Scammers are manipulative, scammers are smart. They're constantly evolving their methods to take advantage of unsuspecting people. But a lot of these scams have something in common. The callers will act like there is urgency in what they need, urgency in sending the money. They'll tell you not to hang up. They'll tell you not to verify with anyone. They'll tell you to send cash or gift cards or some other strange method that you know legitimate government would not ask for, a legitimate company wouldn't ask for. So it's important we know about the scams and we teach people to slow down and verify. Now, I'm gonna explain how these calls even get to us in the first place. How are all of these calls, millions of calls across the United States ending up on all of our cell phones, all of our phones, even landlines? We have found through a number of investigations that a lot of the imposter calls are originating overseas. And one example of a place where a lot are originating is from India, where there are traditionally call centers for legitimate purposes. But criminal actors have taken advantage of that technology, that call center technology, and are using it to their benefit to scam US residents. 
they use what is called voice over IP technology. And that's just a fancy long way of saying calls over the internet. And they use technology on their computers to robo-dial thousands of calls, thousands of phone numbers throughout the United States. They cast a wide net, and then the victims who believe what they've heard will often self-select by pressing one or calling the number back. Instead of being connected with legitimate law enforcement, they're actually connected with a scammer overseas. The scam networks based overseas typically have U.S.-based networks of individuals who transfer and launder the money for them. They will have the victims send the money or they will provide the information about the money to these individuals. The prime, some primary vehicles for the transfer of scam funds from the victims to the networks, the criminal networks, are bank transfers, gift cards, mailed cash, and wire transfers. So um, gift cards, we're seeing more and more of that's growing, where the victim will be told, go buy five gift cards for $200 each, scratch off the back, read the number to me. They'll do that, say, in South Carolina, and sometimes we'll see as fast as 11 minutes, the scam network will have someone in California spin that gift card on products, such as high dollar electronics. Mailing cash is another common one. They'll have the, they'll tell the victims, put cash into an envelope, hide it in magazines or another envelope or even tin foil and mail it to this address. They also will sometimes have them wire money through MoneyGram, Western Union. They do whatever they can to get that money into the hands of their criminal network. And today, we're going to focus on a case study that involved the mailing of cash. This was a case that was indicted in the Northern District of Georgia in 2020. So a pretty recent case that we worked on with it, the federal investigation was led by Social Security Administration OIG office. And John Heslop, we're lucky to have him on the call with us, he led that investigation. What started as an individual victim losing a smaller amount of money ultimately turned into a federal case with over $600,000 in loss. That money was sent because scammers were calling victims and pretending to be that their social security number had been compromised or that they were having tech support issues and were doing the sort of refund scam where they were telling them, I accidentally refunded you money, mail it back to me or I'll get fired. What's so important about this case is it would not have been possible without the work of state and local law enforcement. They were key to this case's success. SSA, OIG, John Heslop, Agent Heslop did an incredible job of pulling together massive amounts of information and data and cases across the country, but it was each individual state and local law enforcement's action that made the case possible, and we'll talk about how that's so. Now, one of the victims that helped break open the case in the beginning was a man who lived in Ohio. He was a vulnerable victim. He actually had a brain injury from a seizure, and the call center, which we determined was based in India, um, took advantage of him. They called him, they pretended to be tech support. He believed that they were there to help him with his computer. And so per their instructions, he gave them remote access to his computer. He gave them remote access to his bank account. The callers made it appear as though money was added to his account. And then following their instructions, wanting to do the good thing and return the money, which actually wasn't a deposit, it was fraudulent and fake, he mailed them $10,000 by UPS to the alias that they provided, Davis Jack, in South Carolina. Fortunately, for the case and for future would-be victims, this victim reported it to Westlake, Ohio Police. 
Westlake Ohio Police then contacted police in South Carolina and they contacted UPS. So now I'm going to turn it over to Detective Moore, who was one of those detectives on the case team in South Carolina who got that notice from Ohio about the package of cash so that she can tell us about what she did in her investigation. Hello, everyone. Um, this case started, um, all started with a telephone call. A detective from Westlake Police Department in Ohio contacted the Aiken Department of Public Safety, ADPS, um, in South Carolina about a money scam. The victim with Westlake PD had been scammed into sending thousands of dollars to a Davis Jack via UPS. The Davis Jack name was familiar to me because I was already looking into several other cases with him. Um, this is why it pays to build a network as a financial crimes investigator. The reason Mr. Jack was picking up the items from the UPS facility is because I had used my contacts with UPS and FedEx to stop Mr. Jack from picking up these packages at the abandoned business he had used on the cases I was already working. Um, and just so you guys know, in law enforcement, a control delivery was out of the question because of safety of UPS and the FedEx drivers. That's just not something we typically do. Um, back to the Westlake Police Department phone call. The detective stated that her victim's package had already been picked up, um, but as she was following up with UPS, she found out that Mr. Jack was scheduled to pick up two more packages on December 19, 2019. After obtaining the information, ADPS made contact with UPS and was able to intercept Mr. Jack at the UPS facility. Westlake PD had provided a photo of Mr. Jack inside the facility picking up, sorry, I forgot to fast forward, um, picking up the um, package, the victim's package, which you see here on the screen. Um, this is how we were able to identify who we were looking for. So when our patrol officers initially met with Mr. Jack, um, they were able to identify him as, um, um, I'm sorry, he was later identified as Mahu Kumar Patel. So I'm going to refer to him um, for the rest of this as Mr. Patel, because he is definitely not Mr. Jack. Um, Mr. Tip Patel was asked to come to um, ADPS headquarters to be interviewed about his packages he was picking up. He voluntarily followed officers to the police station. He was advised of his Miranda rights, which he waived. He gave consent, consent for his vehicle to be searched, as well as his cellular telephone, and he provided the password. So in these cases, a lot of these guys think that they can um, give you the information that you want, but their story is so good with them minimizing their involvement that you're going to let them go. So they will give you the information. Um, he also provided a copy of his driver's license for a Davis jet that had his photo on it. During the interview, Mr. Patel tried to minimize his knowledge and involvement of the scam. He said he was contacted by a friend who said he would help them make some extra money. Um, Mr. Um, Patel was married and had um, a fairly young um, uh, baby at home. So I know everybody that has kids know that you need a little extra cash every now and again. Um, he did not. Um, he said he did not know what was in the packages. He said he didn't know who the people were that he dropped the packages packages off to. He dropped them off in different areas, sometimes in Aiken, sometimes in Columbia, Columbia, South Carolina, just different areas. It was not always the same place. Um, this was all proven to be false. His um, telephone records show evidence of the tracking numbers, when I say tracking numbers, I'm not talking about one or two that's going on in Aiken. He, he had numerous tracking numbers for different um, locations, different 
um, UPS and FedEx tracking numbers all over. Um, as well as he had videos that showed him with large sums of money. Um, and for the record, he never um, met with anyone to transfer the packages. His wife was um, kind of the one, uh, one of the, the uh, leads on this. So he was pretty much working for her. Um, because of all this, I was able to obtain three warrants for Mr. Patel for obtaining goods or money by fraud. Um, so what happened to the two packages that were intercepted? I'm glad you asked. Um, we obtained a search warrant for both packages. Um, both packages contain U.S. currency, which were wrapped in either brown paper bags, newspaper, or a dish towel. Um, one of my victims was 80 years old, and he was from St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, he had already filed a police report with his local police department, which was a good thing because it was very easy to track him down. Um, he also had requested a return on his package. Um, he realized he was being scammed, and so he contacted UPS to um, stop the delivery and have his package returned. Um, so with this, Mr. Patel or Mr. Jack, um, he wouldn't have been able to um, obtain that package anyway. Um, the other victim was a 79-year-old um, from New Jersey, and she did not file a police report because she thought that the police were the ones who originally contacted her. Um, she would not even talk to me on the phone. She was just that scared and that nervous that something was going to happen. So what I had to do was contact a, a local detective in her jurisdiction um, that went to her house and stayed with her while I spoke with her on the phone. Um, once I spoke with her and got all of her information, you know, who she had been talking to, she pretty much received a phone call from someone saying that her social security number was attached to um, a rented car that was found with drugs and money in it, and she had to pay this law enforcement agency to keep her out of trouble, but she also had to um, help them solve this case um, as to who this person was that used her social security number. Um, after the um, detective left her house, he gave me a call back and he said, I noticed that she had several handwritten notes with um, different names and, and phone numbers and amount um, of money and things that she was supposed to do and when she was supposed to do certain things. So um, something to be mindful of is older people, some of them still have home phones, and near that home phone you're going to see a notepad, and they write down everything, phone numbers, names, um, dates and times that they talk to people. So this is all very good information that uh, we need to pay close attention to when we're investigating these kinds of crimes. And you may not even be there for this particular type of crime, speaking to my law enforcement and my adult protective services. You may be there for something completely different, but this information is stuff that can lead us um, into finding out more information about these scammers. Um, uh, because of this, we were able to recover 20, over $20,000 and get back to um, these two victims. So that was one of the, one of the um, things that made me smile in the end of this because I worked so many of these and I never see any progress. Or, um, so I was able to return the money, money to both of these people. Um, some of the key things I want you to leave, I want to leave with you is you have to build a network. When it comes to financial crime, um, especially with the elderly, because they are the ones that they get hit, but they get hit with the highest amount of money. They lose a lot. So. Um, you've got to build that network with local, state, and federal law enforcement 
so you can share information. If you got something going on, you get a name, there's somebody you can call that, you know, you don't have to be trans transferred three or four times before you get somebody that will either listen to you. So it's great to build some network in this, um, not only with law enforcement, but as well with UPS, FedEx, um, the um, adult protective services in your area, just uh, nursing homes. It's always good to build that relationship because it happens to our elderly more than it happens to, well, they lose more than it happens to us um, that are still able to um, get out and work and, you know, build up the income that we lost. Um, another thing is to pay attention to what is right in front of you. If you see multiple IDs, several packages dressed to the same person from all over the United States, handwritten notes with names and numbers, all of this information needs to be collected for evidence. That is stuff that will help build your case. Um, and the last thing I want to say is if you have elderly family and friends, please, please, please keep an eye on them. Keep in contact with them. Find out who they are in contact with and keep an eye on their finances. Not saying that you need to, you know, have access to their bank accounts, but make sure that they are not, you know, sending large amounts of money or withdrawing large amounts of money from their account and not being able to show anything for it. So pay attention to that. And I hope I have um, been able to shed some light on this particular case. There are tons more out there that's like this, but um, the contact that we made with state, federal, and law, and um, local state and federal law enforcement really helped us build this case. So I'm going to turn it over to Agent Hessop to explain how he made a broader case on this. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Detective. Um, thanks for having me on the call today. Um, and hopefully what I can share today is a little bit of information that I've learned over the past um, two years by working these cases. And they can seem daunting when you first take them on, but, you know, a reoccurring theme I'm going to talk about today is the relationships that we make between the locals and state and federal agencies, the use of information that we can pretty get easily, and in, in, in it's in most of these cases, and when you put all this together, you can solve these large, complex cases that involve overseas bad actors. You can definitely do some damage by taking out some of the people that are stateside and try to get recoveries for the victims in the different states. Um, in the way this case started out, as Jolie had mentioned earlier, it didn't start out with a huge amount of money, but there were packages of different amounts. But for this case, between the husband and the wife, we had over 46 packages that came from 17 different states. So individually, each state may have not have been a huge amount of cash that came in the packages, but once you put those together as a whole, you really get that dollar value up. I can't stress this enough. There are really good investigators at all the different shipping companies and through the Postal Service with the postal inspectors. UPS has individual investigators that work throughout the country in different locations. FedEx has the same thing. They're also a little more centralized, but both of those, those groups are very, very um, diligent in what they do. They're tracking these packages, too. Most likely, if you contact them, if you give them a name, they can quickly run through the systems, and they can give you feedback on whether they're seeing that name over and over again. Just like normal other crime you see when people used to use uh, counterfeit checks, uh, they would do, you know, bust out for bank accounts, this is really kind of the same type of crime. If somebody's using a fake ID like we had in this case, they're going to do multiple transactions, they're going to receive multiple packages, and they're going to be from multiple jurisdictions. It's just a matter of asking those right questions. Most of these ups in FedEx, if you do subpoena them, they'll get you returns within a 7- to 10-day period, and you can also ask them to expedite so you can get 
a pretty quick response so your case doesn't run cold on you. The postal inspectors are very good in this as well. Our case had a, um, a component with the postal inspectors. The first set of packages that the individuals were receiving in this case were actually receiving from the postal service. The postal service kind of got leery about packages going to abandoned buildings, as Detective Moore stated earlier. And when they questioned these people, they quickly changed the use of FedEx packages. And then from here on out of the case, FedEx was kind of the mode of transit for all the money cash packages that were coming to both of these money mules. Addresses used by the targets, upon questioning, um, they randomly selected locations. But when you look at them on a map, you can quickly tell that these locations are going to be true to things that are familiar to the money mules. Locations in our case include locations that were within walking distance. Um, the, the wife in this situation worked at a gas station. There were several different places that were either places of business that were open at odd hours or abandoned buildings where they had packages delivered to. So while she was working her shifts, she could actually go pick these packages up. The husband, as Detective Moore mentioned earlier, he came and did several different stops at locations that were outside of where they lived at, but they were the same UPS locations over and over and over again until eventually they became wise. Detective Moore got in contact with other PDs that had losses involved and put it all together. So it's really important to understand that it's a local case, but you can put this all together and the addresses and the use of the same names can add it very quickly. The use of aliases in these cases are important too because Almost all these money mules are going to have fraudulent IDs. Um, we still don't know where they're coming from. Almost every case we have involve IDs from different states. Pennsylvania tends to be a prevalent one. We see um, some Texas. We see some Illinois. But you're going to have fake IDs in all these money mule cases. In this case, it was used for two different purposes. The fake IDs were used, one, to recover packages that came through and they came to that name. But then also, too, once the money mule got the funds, they had to do something with that money. A majority of the time, this same fraudulent ID would be used to take this money to a bank, and then they would make a third-party cash deposit. Most banks don't allow third-party cash deposits, and they question them when they happen. That put this person on the radar for us in a different way. Not only were we tracking her and him through packages through UPS and United Parcel Service and FedEx, we started to track her through the system of bank deposits and through the FinCEN database. You're able to search those, and FinCEN can search by name, by social security number, by driver's license number, and you can get information back on other ones. We were quickly able to see that massive amounts of deposits were being made in the same fictitious names that were receiving packages in the same area. So an example would be package comes to Lexington, person picks it up with alias A. Then we see within the same day or one day later, we see that same alias used to make a third-party cash deposit into a shell company that eventually wires that money and sends it back overseas. So you can quickly put together with using the shipping company information, using the fencing information, and then using the locals to kind of start telling that story of the timelines. So these are things that once you put them together, they start to tell the story of how the money mules operate. So the IDs are, are, are paramount in this because these people will have multiple IDs. In our case, we had over 15 different aliases that were used between the husband and wife. They usually keep these picture IDs on their phones. So when you do get a chance to arrest them or question them and get access to the phones, either through a consent search or a search warrant, you're going to find these IDs on the phone. The scammers, the bad actors who are overseas, in many of the occasions, they would actually send information to the mule saying, a package is coming on this day, it's, you need to use this alias ID, and it's coming to this address. Well, then the person will respond. The scammers will even send a picture of the ID. Hey, here's the ID I sent you. This is the one you need to use. Then also on the phone, you can also basically determine how they were able to get those IDs. In this case, we had several headshots of both people that were stored on their phone data, and then we saw that they were texted using the WhatsApp app back overseas. We knew the IDs were created from that and then sent back to the money mules to be able to purpose to grab cash and do third-party cash deposits. The tracking info in these cases is also vital because of two reasons. Most of these packages are not going to only be tracked by the money mules on the ground. They're also tracked by the scammers who are overseas. If somebody is checking packages 
on a very large scale, which we had here. Some of these packages that were sent were checked as many as 60 times within a three-day period or a two-day period or an overnight period because the scammers overseas kept checking to make sure the package was being delivered, and then the person who was the money mule on the ground is checking that package continuously. In our case, we got lucky. The wife created an online FedEx and UPS account. So what happens is you're assigned through that a UUID, which is a U unique identifying number, and it was assigned to her. When she started that account, we were able to subpoena FedEx and UPS and get her UUID. That gives us the IP address where that account was set up from. We were lucky, and that IP address for the UUID came back to her personal cell phone that we knew she was using to make calls and use the WhatsApp app. So these numbers, it seems daunting when you start talking about IP addresses and WhatsApp and encrypted and, and packages from all over the country, but when you kind of break it down to the micro layers of what's happening, it, it kind of makes sense. The WhatsApp app is a unique thing. We, we see that in all the cases now. The WhatsApp, if you're not sure what that is, that's an end-to-end -end encryption. You can make phone calls, text messages. You can send videos over this. The WhatsApp is unique to the person on their phone because when they're logged in with their passcode through their IP they started the account, all the information flows freely. If the person locks out of their phone or doesn't give law enforcement a passcode, that information is stored within the WhatsApp, and it's very difficult for us to pull that or dump it off a phone once we get access to it. But in the WhatsApp app, as Jolie had mentioned earlier, this is their go-to application for sending information to the money mules of where to pick the money up, what names to use, what the denominations are going to be. Once these folks would pick up this money, they would take a video of themselves opening the packages, and they would literally count the money out, $100 by $100 bill, all the way it got to a final amount. They would then send this video back to the handlers who were in other countries, and then that person would then send them a bank account a routing number, and a name of where they wanted that cash deposit would be. After they make that deposit, they would then send a picture of the completed deposit slip back to the back actor. So they're making your case for you. They're giving you the victim who you can subpoena and get the information, call that victim, find out that they were a victim of a crime. You have on the video now them counting the money out of that package. Most of the time they take a quick image of the label so it's telling you who it's coming from. They're counting it out, and then you know the company that they're making the deposit into. So you're able to identify who's giving directions, who's picking up, who the victim is, and who the company that benefits from it. it, it extremely important. The other way the phone becomes important is these phones are basically computers that people are carrying around these days, and they're basically diaries of the money mule's lives. So they're using the phones not just for the criminal element of this, um, uh, picking up cash packages, but they're also using it for their personal lives. They're using it to log into their banking. They're taking family pictures. And in our case here, we had a couple of extravagant vacations. We had a trip to Disney World. We had a bunch of other things that came up that showed us that they were living beyond their means, which then tells us that based on the jobs they had and based on the wages we know they were getting, this is a supplemental way of income that's bringing them in money. So it kind of helps us complete that story and close the loop on how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and then how they're benefiting from it. And I know Detective Moore talked about this earlier, but I'll just hit on this as well. A common theme we see when we talk to these um, money mules is they will tell us that they had no idea that this money was bad or whatever, or they didn't know where it was coming from, or they give you some story that just doesn't sound believable. Knowledge is not a, a factor in this they are receiving large sums of money that they know are not coming from people who they claim they're coming from. A lot of times they'll say, well, it's coming from a relative somewhere overseas. The packages are clearly shipped from the United States. Most of the time, you're going to have um, some way or some way, some form or some fashion to show that they knew what was going on. Our people in this case knew what they were doing was wrong and they thought it was kind of funny. But the questions you want to ask when you interview these people, okay, if this was a legitimate source of work and you found this off the Internet, why would you use a fraudulent ID with your picture and somebody else's name that you know is not your own? Why would you go into a bank and deposit money into another person's account or a business account knowing it doesn't belong to you and not knowing where the money comes from? So those questions like that kind of draw out some answers that are interesting, and they kind of piece it together. Some will be honest with you. So, some won't, but it all depends on the kind of person you're dealing with. Some people are leery of what's going on and they want to tell you the truth. Other people do not. They kind of shut down. 
um, when it comes to these type of investigations. Again, fake IDs, they're prevalent in all these money mule cases, but that's where it starts. Um, especially at the local level, you, you have detectives like Detective Moore and, and Wise Barth out of Ohio and all these other ones. We were able to work together and piece this together, but it wasn't until we were able to understand the names and the packages and the victims to be able to, to, to kind of understand how the fraud was happening. In this situation with this case that we're talking about today, we were able to develop a ring of six people that we knew were in all different states, and they were all getting packages from the same people and bad actors in, in, in a foreign country. That helped us understand how these people operated. The WhatsApp was the same in all. The IDs were the same from the same state. The phone numbers they each called were all the same. Lead lists are important, too. What we found in this is most of these folks keep all the victims' names on their phones. Some of these uh, victims are victimized as many as eight to ten times. The original case study that Julie talked about in the beginning, um, that poor victim sent over 12 packages to different people, but she sent numerous to our two people that we're talking about in South Carolina. So this was a reoccurring victim. These people knew the names. They realized that this person is being victimized over and over again, but they keep these things in their phones. So once again, very, very valuable piece of evidence um, when it comes to these type of cases and putting all this together. The participation of this, like I talked about, the, the fake IDs, the receiving the large sums of cash, um, another detection thing that came up for us, we would always ask them, if this is a legitimate business, why didn't you just have the packages mailed to your house? Well, they couldn't answer that. And then they were using places that were vacant. If it's really legitimate, why didn't you go to a FedEx shipping center? Why didn't you get it from a UPS or why didn't you have it sent to the regular post office? They're avoiding detection and picking out places in unison with the bad actors overseas using Google Maps. We know that from interviews with these people. Um, the bank accounts used. Um, after looking at all the bank accounts, we would see that they would do cash deposits. It was out of the ordinary for their normal use and their paychecks that they got, and the amounts were always structured amounts, 1500 2000 3000 You know, these amounts would be recurring because that was the money that the murals were getting to keep from the cash packages. From what we've been told, normally the average is anywhere between 7 to 10% is what the money mule gets to keep from a cash package when they receive it. You can quickly see that money flow to their personal bank accounts, and then it goes out for expenditures. Another thing that I want to circle back around to, the FinCEN. FinCEN is, a, is an unbelievable resource to use, um, and if you don't have access to it, please team up with somebody that can get you access or, or just call one of the federal agencies, people like me, HSI, Secret Service, they're all phenomenal and very, very willing to help locals and states in sums of 5,000, 7, 10, 15, whatever it may be. They'll go in and make these very large cash deposits. It's out of the ordinary. It kind of sets off red flags to these folks, and then they'll file these in the system. That's why you want to search these people by their alias names. You want to search them by addresses and bank locations. So you can search all that stuff in FinCEN, and it will give you returns, and it may just give you a leg up on linking these cases together. And it was very, very important in this case, Ex extremely important. So as far as criminal charges, uh, almost every state, including South Carolina, where this was originally pr being prosecuted at, there's a, um, uh, uh, obtaining property in false pretenses or a theft by false pretenses. Almost all of these are going to fall under that because there's a victim who's been duped or schemed through one of the scams that Jolie mentioned earlier to send this money. At the federal level, what, we're, what we try to do, because we don't have really a theft statute, we either try to do the concealment of money laundering, an aiding and abetting of money laundering, a, a mail fraud or a wire fraud. The wire fraud kicks in because these people making these deposits and if I make a third-party cash deposit today in South Carolina, that cash becomes immediately available for somebody to withdraw in one of the 50 states. So it's a wire transfer and a fraud, and then an unlicensed money transfer business. We're seeing a lot of that. Some of the money mill stuff that we dealt with previously in the last two years have went in where people are basically just remitting so much money, they almost should be a, a, a licensed money remitter. But now we're starting to see more use of Bitcoin, Zelle, um, and money orders is we're seeing massive amounts. Bitcoin is kind of like the wild, wild west right now when it comes to transfers. It's hard to track. It's unlicensed. There's ATMs now that you can use for this. So you may start to see this evolve in some of your cases. Victims are being asked in the past to do these cash packages, a wire transfer. What we're seeing now is they're having victims actually take cashier's checks and 
and they're having the victim deposit them into the shell account, so they're cutting the money mule out. It reduces their risk of having somebody arrested who may expose them, or they're having them buy Bitcoin. They'll send them a Bitcoin wallet ID, and they'll have them deposit that way. So just be on the lookout for the different variants of these scams that are happening now because they are evolving as we as law enforcement start to do the things we do, cut the money mules out, start to take some of the financial means out. We have to have a change in how we do things and of course they change how they do things and make it a little tougher for us to go after. And the last thing I'll say is I've probably done about 200 victim interviews in the last two years and I've had people who lost um, $2,000. I've interviewed people that have lost $1.5 million. The senior citizens who are falling prey to this, they're, people think there's some type of, it's always a cognitive issue or they're not intelligent. That could be further from the truth. I had a chief of police lose $100,000. I had a person that was a rocket scientist, not joking, lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had another person that was a, um, a very prominent criminal attorney out of California who lost $500,000. They believe in law and order the most time when you talk to them. When somebody tells them they're in trouble, somebody says they're going to be arrested, somebody says your family's in trouble, somebody says your Social Security number's been compromised, these people take it seriously, they listen, they try to do the right thing, they're very law-abiding. That, I believe, is almost to their own detriment because they do want to do the right thing. The second thing is, this is an embarrassing thing. Most of these people are very prideful people. They've lived very successful lives. They've done very well for themselves. It's an embarrassment when something like this happens. They don't want their spouses to know. They don't want their children to know. They don't want their neighbors to know. So a lot of times when you first contact them, they're very, very hesitant to talk to you about what happened. You kind of got to take a general approach. Hey, let, I want to help you. Let me try to get your money back. Just tell me what happens and try to get these people to open up because it's, it's a perfect storm when it comes to these type of frauds. It's a very vulnerable section of people, they're older, they're at the end of their life cycles, and they just don't want all this stress. So when they're defrauded, these folks are getting away with this. We're catching some, but you would need a thousand agents to work this up on a daily basis to make a dent. So as Margaret mentioned, the educational part of this thing is huge. We've got to keep educating people about gift cards and, and foreign wire transfers and sending cash to the mail and all that good stuff, but also too, it's the education point of us just talking to our citizens when we interact with them, talking to our parents, talking to our siblings, and just letting everybody know that this stuff is happening. Because now this fraud is turning the corner. The coronavirus has changed the frauds now. Now we have mortgage mod frauds popping up with these same people. We have um, coronavirus mortgage scams. We have PPP loans. And now we have fake stimulus calls that are happening offering additional stimulus loans from the government, and they're having to pay an escrow or something to get this. So. Just keep your eyes and ears to the ground. You're going to probably hear a lot of stuff. Um, my name and number will be on here. If anybody has any questions, please, always feel free to reach out to me. And if I don't know the answer, I can probably find it. And if you need help from a certain agency, I probably know somebody there, and I'm more than willing to help you. So I appreciate your time today. And, um, Jolie, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, John. Uh, just a quick note on the this what is called a warning letter. If you encounter someone who is a money mover or what is often called a money mule, and uh, you, you realize they had no idea of what they were doing, they thought they were doing a legitimate job. You look on their phone, there's no evidence of intent. You can give them a letter warning them that it may be a crime, and then if they continue to engage, that's evidence of intent. Um, just a quick note, we're going to wrap up very soon, um, but whenever law enforcement comes across the victims of these scams or individuals moving money on behalf of them, um, it is so important that they document it in a police report and report it to the federal databases. There are two. IC3.gov is the FBI database for cybercrime, and then other, such as phone scams that don't involve the Internet, the FTC Sentinel database at reportfraud.ftc.gov. And everyone in law enforcement can gain access to that FTC database to help build your own cases. If you don't have the access, you can go to register.consumersentinel.gov and register for access, and you'll see if you have one victim in your jurisdiction, there often are more. And 
one final point is that the key to solving this problem, in addition to working with local and state law enforcement to investigate and prosecute these cases, is to educate the public and educate those that we come into contact with. I see we have Kathy Stokes um, on with us today. The AARP has great resources as well as FTC. And FTC will send them to you in bulk if you go to ftc.gov slash bulk order, you can order handouts and materials that you can give to community members so that they can educate themselves and protect themselves from these scams. And here's our contact information. We appreciate all of your time today and feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions and we'll have a moment for questions in the chat box as well. Yeah, Jolie, it looks like you do have one or two questions that we can take. We've got about two minutes left. All right, I see there's actually been some great interaction in the chat box. Jeff Myers um, asked about uh, why are they having these packages sent in the U.S. to a U.S. address? And I think Kathy's response is the one that I would give. Um, international addresses would raise flags for the person being coerced. Um, Jeff made another great point. He's seeing a lot of these by gift cards. Um, we are still seeing scammers encouraging people to send money by cash, and we're seeing a, a real increase in the use of gift cards as well. Um, if we were to teach you about how to investigate, I think there was an investiga a question about how should local law enforcement handle it if the funds were sent by gift cards, money orders, Bitcoin. Those will be a whole, those need to be, and um, we're working on other trainings, but we could spend an hour talking about each of those and how to investigate gift card scams. But yes, the scammers are using a variety of methods to tr get the victims to transfer the cash or gift card. Um, Kathleen asked, can you tell us how they get our phone numbers to scam us? It, 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 scammers we have seen in other cases have emails where they share with one another lead lists that contain tens of thousands of U.S. residents, uh, names, social security numbers, addresses, phone numbers. The information is out there. How they obtain it, it, it appears to be through some illegal means. Um, I just know that they, there is a trade in these what are called lead lists and they obtain them by sharing them and paying for them through illegal means. And now we're at 2.59, so I'll let it shift <laughs> to the poll. Okay, so I um, thank you for presenting uh, all this information to us. I think we've got a great local, state, and federal law enforcement um, uh, model for how you can work together, which is what we wanted to promote today. Um, but I also want to, uh, I know my audience joins us in thank thanking our three presenters today.